Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. This is the next episode in the Coding a 2D Game Engine in Java series. In the last episode, what we did was loading levels with JSON. We encountered a bug at the end of that tutorial, but we will be solving that first thing in this tutorial. And we will also be doing something super cool, which I am really excited about because we will be exposing variables to the editor through the use of reflection. This is just like Unity does, and it saves us a ton of hassle and makes everything so much nicer. And it's just a really cool feature to have if you're making your own engine or level editor or anything. So we will take a look at how that works and then we will implement it and we will also fix that bug. All right, let's get started. All right, so before we actually start coding, I do wanna formalize the exact problem that we are trying to solve. So inside of your game world, you will have several components that look something like this. And within these components, you will have several fields is what they're called that look like this. So these are your private and public member variables to this class. Now, usually you want to save these fields. Well, not usually, you always want to save these fields for a level because you want your initial starting point to always remain the same. So how do we go about exposing these to IAM GUI so that we can say change them and save them easily, right? Because we want to change these in an easy to use manner. We want an IAM GUI window to pop up that reflects this exactly where it basically has a box that's like, this is your friction and then you can change it here. And then you have another box that's like, this is your velocity and you can change this here and so on and so forth. And the red is public and the blue is private. I differentiated that because you know, sometimes you might want to differentiate that too. So what we can do is we can use Java's reflection and Java's reflection allows us to say something like get fields on a class. And what this does is it returns all of these member variables, public, private, protected, transient, everything. It gives us everything. We can check whether it's public or private and do all that type of stuff, which I'll show you how to in case you want to. But the other cool thing we can do is we can find out what type each of these are. And since we have a limited number of types that are really going to be exposed, a limited number that we can have, we can actually create a function for the most common types and it will cover all those. And then if you need to do something a little bit more complex, we can let the user decide how to do that. So we'll take a look at how to start doing this automatically by creating one sort of God function that basically creates all of the IAM GUI windows that we may need. And then we can add functionality to this as we see fit in the future, or we can just create custom ones for specific components. And I'll show you how we can do both of those in this video. So let's take a look at how to get those fields and then start creating an actual IAM GUI window for all our components. So the best place to put this whole functionality, of course, is going to be inside of our abstract component class. What we're going to do is we're going to implement this IAM GUI function and it can be overridden if any of the in classes inherited in this would like to do so. Basically, what we're going to be doing is exactly what I said. We're going to be getting those fields. So we have to wrap this in a try catch because there is something that could happen, which is called an illegal access exception. And we're just going to say e.print stack trace. Basically what that means is you just try to get a member variable that doesn't exist. We don't have to worry about that too much because we will not actually be getting anything that is not explicitly in the class anyways. So next what we're gonna say is field and I'm gonna import that from Java's reflect fields equals this dot get class dot get declared fields. What this is gonna do is it's gonna get it from whatever subclass is currently running this component. So it's not going to be doing it on component, but if it was a rigid body, it would be doing rigid bodies class get declared fields, which would get all of these fields for us. Then what we can say is for field, field in fields, we'll do a, a loop and then we will basically start to do the part which is building the I'm GUI window for each field. So what we have to do is we have to first figure out the type. So we'll say the type is this current fields type so this would be like if we were on this game, this first one, it would be like the type is game object. Then the object if we, or the value is just the field dot get this. This is the way you get the actual value contained within that field using reflection. And then we would say string 
name equals field dot get name. And so the name is just going to be whatever this is. So whatever you named it. So game object would be the name of this one. And then the object would be null for this, since that is the value currently contained within that field. Next, we can just simply start creating a bunch of different cases. So we'll say if type equals int dot class. And also, in this case, I would usually do a switch statement, but you can't do a switch statement with class uh, comparisons. So we're just going to stick with a type because it's just simplest. What we can do now is we'll say int val equals, and we're going to cast this to an integer, the value that we got, so that we have it as an integer. And then we're going to do say int array I am int equals val because I am GUI expects an array for an integer. And then we'll give it a drag int. So we'll say if I am GUI dot drag int name plus colon, and we're going to give it that I am int. And then we'll say field dot set this I am int zero. So what the heck did I just do here? I said if, and then I gave it the I am GUI that we are working with. So this is a drag integer where you drag an integer. Then the label we gave it is the name. So that would be like game object colon. And then the value I gave it was whatever the current value is. Then if this changes, we set the field to whatever that changed variable would be. So let's see a concrete example of this. Let's create a new component that will sort of be our test component. We'll just call this rigid body because they have lots of uh, easy to use variables that everyone uses all the time. Okay. So we say that extends component. Then what we're going to do is we're just going to give us, give ourselves a few variables. So we're going to have a public integer. Uh, we'll call this collider type. And then we'll have, we'll initialize this to zero. And we'll say public, actually, and let's not make these public. Let's make these private just so that you can see that this will still work. And then we'll do a private um, float friction equals 0.8f. Then we'll do a public vector 3f velocity equals, and we'll initialize this to 0, 0.5f, 0. And then we'll do one more transient one. We'll say public transient. And this will be uh, vector 4f equals a new vector 4f, 0, 0, 0, 0. And it's not going to be called vector 4f. It's going to be called uh, our temporary variable. So this is the variable we just don't want to show up, which is how we'll decide that for now. Now, let's go into our level editor scene. And let's actually add this component to this guy. Let's just say obj1 to add component. And we'll say new rigid body. And we'll check and see what happens. So nothing's going to happen because of that bug. <laughs> OK, I said we would figure out that bug real quick. Let's actually figure out that bug. And then we also get an illegal cast exception. So, OK, so first let's solve that bug real quick. So if we go into our window class, um, we did current scene dot load right here. And I actually have a to do in here because I did look at it right after I finished that video and we save it right here. So what's happening? Why are we getting that duplication error? Well, I say move this into the change scene function to fix duplication bug. How is that going to fix it? So if we go into change scene, which is up here, what we do is we say current scene equals new scene. Then we say current scene dot init. Well, what happens in init? Well, in the case of level editor scene, we check and see if the level was loaded. If it was, we return. Well, the level is not going to be loaded yet, right? Because we actually load it right down here which is right before we start the loop. And when do we start the loop? We start the loop right after we change the scene completely. So that gets called, then this gets called. So we actually create those and then we double create them by calling that. So I'm going to copy and paste this and we will just say paste it instead right up here, right before we do the init. And then we'll do the same thing here. And we could actually too, just do this. I do want to eventually switch this to um, instead of doing a number to just have them pass in the scene. That way it's more flexible. And then we could get rid of all of this and then we could just do everything down here. But anyways, yeah, so that should fix the duplication bug. So let's try this again. And then we're getting another bug down there, which I will talk about in just a second. So we get nothing. And the reason we get nothing is because of another thing that we have to worry about. So sprite render 
So the reason we're not seeing them is because we had is dirty set to false, and so they were never being told to update, which means we never actually saw them. So if we just initialize is dirty to true, and then we get them, and then we get an error with our texture. So that's just another thing that we'll have to worry about. But I'm going to save that for later because right now we are worrying about exposing these to the level editor. So let's go back into here and we will make our active game object. If the level is loaded, we'll say is equal to game objects dot get zero. So we'll just get the zeroth game object and get that. Okay. Now we have this game object as our active game object again. But you'll notice we're getting this error now, which is saying it's because we're trying to access a, member, a private member. So if we look, it says this field is private. So what we can do is we'll first of all set boolean is private equal to, and then we'll say modifiers dot is private. And then we'll say field dot get modifiers. So this is how we can check and see if something is private. And then you can also check and see if it's protected and so on and so forth. We'll say if is private, and then we want to set it so that we can actually access this field. So we'll say field.set accessible true. Then we will go ahead and do everything. And then after we finish, we'll say if is private field.set accessible false. So basically what we're doing here is we're temporarily changing it to a public field. And then as soon as we finish with this, we're sending it to a non-public field. So if we do this again, you'll notice we can now access this. I'm going to change that to 10. And we get no errors. And then if we reload this, you'll notice it has saved the new value. So what we have done there, we just exposed that variable to our editor, right? So we have this thing called collider type, and it was set to zero, and we exposed it. So now we just have to go ahead and do the same thing for friction, velocity, and this temp variable we should make it because I'm going to use transient as a keyword. That means we cannot expose it. So let's go ahead and get those last things up too. And it's actually exactly as you would think. We'll just do something like else if type equals float dot class. Say int. Actually, this is going to be a float now. Float val equals float value. And we'll say float array, I am float equals val. And we'll say if I am GUI.drag float. And we're gave it the name plus a semicolon. And I am float. And then we'll say field.set this, I am float zero. So same thing. That's floats done. Now let's do else if type equals bool in dot class. <laughs> I've been coding in C++, it's bool in C++. <laughs> so we'll say boolean val equals boolean value. And then we'll say boolean ray I am bool equals val. Then we'll say if I am GUI dot check box. So we'll just give it a checkbox. And actually we don't even need to do the array thing too. We'll just say name plus colon. And then we'll pass it the value. So we can actually just take that part out. And then we'll say if it was checked or unchecked, then we'll just say val equals not val. So that one's actually pretty simple. We can just change it. Actually, we'll, we'll do set. So we'll say field.set this, and then we'll give it the value. Actually, no, we should do val equals not val. <laughs> okay, because otherwise, if we don't, it's not actually changing this value. And so we actually need to change it ourselves. So we do this, and then we say field.set this to val, or more concisely, like that. Okay, sorry about that. Now, <laughs> let's do a vector3 real quick. We'll say else if type equals vector3f.class. Uh, we will do a vector3f array. So first of all, we'll say vector3f, val equals vector3f, value. And then we will say float. Uh, I am vec equals, and then we'll give it the val dot x, val dot y, and val dot z. Then we'll say if I am GUI dot drag float three, and we'll give it that I am vec, or actually we have to give it a name first. So we'll say name plus colon, and then we'll give it the I am vec. Then we will say val dot set 
actually we'll say field. Yeah, we'll do val.set first. And then we'll say I am vec zero, I am vec one, I am vec two. And this one should actually change the field too. So like because these work different, these are different than uh, primitive types. So if you change one of these, you're actually changing the actual object. Whereas if you change a primitive type, you have to say field.set because you're not actually changing the primitive. You, you're literally just copying that value. So difference between those, which is why we're doing this. Let's run this real quick. We should see the other one parts of our fields popping up. So if I make this bigger, you'll notice we have collider type, we have friction, we have velocity, and they all have the initial values that we had, which is really cool too. But if I change them, and then I exit, and then I go back in, it saved the values that I got, which is super cool. So we are now exposing these to our editor. Let's go ahead and also say uh, vector four, because this way we can actually implement that transient keyword. So we'll say else if it's a vector four f dot class. I'm just going to copy this because it is very similar. Uh, change this to vector four f instead. Change this to vector four f, and then we will also give it val dot w, and then we will also set it to I am vec three, and we will change this to a drag float four. Okay, so that should be good for vector four f. And then what we're going to notice is we actually get this temp variable in here. We don't want it to be in there because we marked it as transient. So what we can do is just like we did for our private up at the top, we'll say boolean is transient equals modifier dot is transient. And then we'll get field dot get modifiers. Then we can say if is transient continue. We'll just skip over all the transient variables. That way we have a way to mark things that we don't want exposed in our editor, which is nice. So now if we run this again, temp is now gone, but we have all the other variables. And if we change them, we save the values. This is a huge, huge step in getting our level editor done. Now that we have a way to do this, where we can literally just add it in one place and it adds it for every single component, uh, building our level editor will be really nice and easy. So what's up with this texture too, you might ask. Um, I think I know what the problem is. If we go into our level editor scene, we load the resources, but what doesn't get loaded, blend image two does not get loaded. So what we should actually do is just copy this, paste it right here, and let's see if that fixes it. I'm not sure if this will. <laughs> Okay, so it fixed it, but uh, I'm using the wrong image there. <laughs> so something clearly happened, okay? So what happened here, what I'm going to take a guess at so that we can fix this in the next tutorial. Notice how it's a completely different texture. I think what happened is because of the order we're loading things, okay? So in here, we, we load this first, then we load this. Whereas down here, we load this first, then this. So if I move this down, I think it's going to fix that issue. Okay, and it fixes that issue, but I'm going to say that's definitely not the behavior we want. So we're going to have to relook at our asset pool and make sure that when somebody, or actually we can just relook at how we're building textures, and then we can look for, see if we have the texture available and everything, and figure stuff out that way when we're loading stuff in. Yeah, so we'll take a look at that, because Right now what it's doing is it's doing it based on the ID. So this would be zero, one. And then if we swap them, now all of a sudden this is zero, this is one. And because of the way we save the data, we only save the ID. So then it all of a sudden it's taking this sprite sheet instead. So that is the problem. And we will take a look at how to solve that in the next tutorial. But yeah, I hope you guys like this. This is, like I said, a huge step to fixing or completing our level editor. In the next tutorial, what I plan on doing is expanding our level editor so that we can actually start uh, hopefully maybe dragging and dropping stuff in and placing them in the scene. If not that, we will be definitely building like the things specific to level editor scene. So we will actually be building a window that is specific to our level editor that will allow us to begin doing the drag and drop stuff. I hope you guys like this. If you did, please hit like and subscribe, and I will see you in the next tutorial. Thanks. See ya.